Hey folks, and welcome to Typology, the show in which we explore the mystery of the human personality through the lens of the Enneagram. I'm Anthony Skinner, producer of the show, and hey, we're happy that you're here with us today. We've got two great guests, Tim Mackey and John Collins from The Bible Project. Now, I don't know if you've ever heard of The Bible Project. Chances are you probably have because their thing has blown up. They have over a million subscribers on YouTube. They have like 70 plus thousand followers on Instagram. But let me tell you what it is. The Bible Project, it's an animation studio that produces short form, fully animated videos to make the biblical story accessible to everyone everywhere. They create videos, podcasts, and study guides that explore the Bible's unified story. It's really cool. They'll take like uh, the Torah or a book of the Bible or a theme and create a whole animated short around it. So it's super creative and really informative and um, just entertaining as well. Tim and John will dialogue as you watch the animated short. Really, really cool. Anyway, they're both fives. They work together and we cover a lot of ground and a show that runs well over an hour. A lot of fun and a really, really informative, great content. So we're glad that you're here. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at Typology Podcast and on Instagram at Typology Podcast. You can follow Ian on Twitter at Ian Cron, and you can follow Ian on Instagram at Ian Morgan Cron. And let me hit you with one last thing because I haven't told you about this in a while, but it is a really big deal and it does help uh, us tremendously. I want to tell you about our Patreon campaign. Now, if you aren't familiar with it, Patreon is a way for you to support content you love, like Typology, on a monthly basis. For as little as a dollar a month, you can partner with us to help us cover costs for stuff that takes to pull off the show, which it really, there's a lot behind the scenes that goes on to make it happen. So we so appreciate um, your continued support there on Patreon. All you have to do is go to www.patreon.com forward slash typology. That's www.patreon.com forward slash T-Y-P-O-L-O-G-Y and select the level at which you would like to support the show. And not only will you receive our undying love and gratitude, but you're going to get a bunch of great bonus content as well. Even a dollar a month, folks, it's a huge, huge help. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that's it for me, Anthony Skinner. And now here is the host of our show, Ian Cron. John Collins, Tim Mackey from The Bible Project. Welcome to Typology. Thanks, Ian. Yeah. Good to be here. Thanks, Ian. It's uh, it's rare that I get two fives on on the show. Uh, <laughs> you know, I got to shake a lot of trees before two fives are willing to fall off the branch and come out and talk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so it's really fun to have you here and um, really fun because, you know, your work at The Bible Project is pretty extraordinary and so artful. And what you're doing in some ways is so congruent with the way that, that, you know, the way that fives are in the world. And some of the things mm. you do are not congruent with it at all oh, uh, in some ways. So anyway, um, so both of you are fives. How did, how did the two of you meet? Huh. Yeah, we met in college. Mm -hmm. uh, we were living uh, in a house that was free to live in if you worked at this church yeah. as an intern. And we both were interns yeah. at a doing skateboard ministry stuff. There's a church that built a, a skateboard park in its back parking lot as like an outreach ministry uh, and uh, through a public skate park. So we, we both served as like volunteer staff and lived in this house that was across the street from the Christian college that we were going to. And we only crossed over by a summer. And during that summer, Tim <laughs> spent most of the time in the basement reading Isaiah and Hebrew. <laughs> so I didn't really hang out with him a lot. <laughs> Our friendship kind of blossomed after that. Yeah. yeah. I was I was a little obsessive. <laughs> I well, think I am still. Yeah, you're still a little <laughs> Okay, obsessive. I guess I'm, yeah. I'm there anyway. Well, that's what we're here to talk about, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to try and work it out for you, Tim. Yeah, that's all I'm going to say right sweet. now. Awesome. So, yeah. I, I, you know, just the skateboarding thing made my ears perk. Is there, are there a yeah. disproportionate number of uh, skateboarders who are fives? I don't know. Man, I, you know, actually, I thought a lot about this because... Uh, because you're a five. <laughs> well, that's, yeah, totally. Uh, yeah, that's right. Um, and also, the skateboarding scene in Portland uh, has a real unique 
vibe to it that's different than California skate culture. Because uh, Portland, it rains a lot, and so you have to be indoors way more. And so the, you know, when I was growing up, at least, the skateboard scene was way more tied to the like art scene. Like half my friends skateboarding were also in art majors, you know, uh, and or in graffiti art or something. So, yeah, I think there is something to that. The rainy, dark w winters <laughs> uh, create a certain kind of... But yeah. I think that goes California skateboarders are a different breed. Yeah, a little more aggressive and ambitious style. Yeah, and extroverted. Yeah. Anyway, so, yeah, there's there is something there. I, I think there's something to that. There's something about the uh, the dedication to and i'm in all uh full disclosure i didn't grow up skateboarding and nor ah. did i skateboard at the skateboard ministry i rollerbladed <laughs> <laughs> and it's something i don't like to admit publicly except now you are <laughs> very 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 publicly, <laughs> very, very publicly. <laughs> it's better that i say it now than I, I meet someone someday and they're like hey let's go skateboard and it's yeah. like actually i don't really <laughs> skateboard yeah i can't enough to yeah. pretend, but there's something about they're saying, but in both of those, both of those sports, there's something about repetition, repetition, and mastery. That's what I was gonna say. Repetition to gain mastery, yeah, that attracts a certain kind of personality yeah. that doesn't want to play on a team. Yes, they want to master this on their own trip. time, on their own schedule. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, so it, and can endure some pain. It attracts idiosyncratic, more introverted types. Yeah. I think that anyway. is funny. So, so John, you you actually had a rollerblading ministry. Yeah, <laughs> there was there, there there was a night there was a the the, the skate park was open five <laughs> nights a week, uh -huh. and one of those nights was for rollerbladers only. And actually, you know what's funny? Aggr I'm sorry, this is not relevant, but it's awesome. Aggressive inline skating <laughs> is the. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I I remember I remember when uh, the park started opening to rollerbladers, and it used to be together with skaters. Oh yeah, That's and good, fights man. broke out. Yeah. Like the rollerbladers were yeah. so shunned and ostracized yeah, totally. <laughs> that they decided to give them their own night of the week mm -hmm. and then the fight stopped. Yeah, so in every other good. category of life, I am, um, you know, I'm a white male <laughs> and I, you know, like I'm, I'm not, I've never a minority, but as a rollerblader, yeah, you kind of learn what it's like to be marginalized. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyhow. So, John, John, I, all I can visualize right now is you in portland rollerblading in the rain yeah. listening to <laughs> michael jackson oh goodness <laughs> yeah through yeah. your yeah. earbuds in, through your earbuds no. with a, walk, with, with like, a walk you're, man yeah you're thinking of like <laughs> yeah. the rollerbladers on boardwalks down in california and stuff yeah 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 oh yeah yeah you were far hipper than that right oh yeah <laughs> but i mean like it, it, we were totally mimicking skateboard culture so mm -hmm. you would you would look at us and go, oh, that's a skateboarder, and then you'd see us strap on some boots, and you'd be like, what's, <laughs> what's happening? <laughs> oh man, that is that that's yes, that's worth the price of admission, right there. There it goes. <laughs> but it was that that. Here's, so, but that, here's what something really interesting is Tim and a few friends. They're all Hebrew scholars, and they all grew up skateboarding in Portland together. Yeah, and it's so it's so unique. Yeah. There's something, something there, something weird happened. Yep. Yeah, there's four, four friends that we all became followers of Jesus through this ministry. We met and uh, just signed up for classes at uh, this college, Multnomah Bible College. And uh, yeah, we all got so, just transferred our allegiance yeah. <laughs> to all things Bible nerddom. And uh, we all ended up, yeah, getting PhDs in Hebrew Bible. And, yeah. and uh, it's awesome. And we're, talking, we're talking about big, big positions too. Yeah. Yeah, they're insanely brilliant people. Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> yeah, so I, yeah, that's always been a unique thing about that friend circle is how all of us ended up on the same kind of path together. I wonder if they're fives. I'm certain that's the case. You think so? Well, you're not supposed to identify other people on their behalf, right? Yeah. So <laughs> that's my guess. <laughs> I'm just going to let you guys go. I'll just... <laughs> yeah, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. yeah. yeah I'm are. just going to sit here and listen. Bantering. Just yeah. intently. I'm going to observe <clears throat> yeah. while you guys talk. Yeah. It, that'll yeah. be a good thing. <laughs> Tim, you are you, you have a PhD in Semitic languages and biblical studies. Yeah. You're, you're, you're teaching at Western Seminary and you're the... You've been a pastor and now yeah. you are the, I guess, the the... Biblical guru, right? Yeah. Yeah. Go-to guy at the Bible yeah. Project. And John, 
you're affectionately known, I'm told, as the architect of ideas. <laughs> yes. Love. You're someone <laughs> totally. who knows how to make complex ideas simple. Yeah. Is what I'm told. Is that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah that's yep. where my focus is on. Yep. Yeah. That phrase, actually, I stole from a friend who who has the same kind of temperament and um, use that phrase. I was like, that's a, that's a great phrase. I yeah. love that. Yeah. Architect of ideas. Yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, John and I's friendship, well, though we met all those years ago at the skateboard ministry, actually our, our friendship really began to form as we were, I had finished school and was on in seminary. He was finishing at Multnomah. And I think you were starting to really have a lot of kind of crisis question moments with the Bible and your faith. Yeah. And so our wives uh, were also friends at the time. And so we would get together and just have these great conversations. And so I'm so down to like talk about complex stuff about the Bible and theology. And, uh, and so what I found was John was looking for a, a kind of clarity and a core, like getting to the core, the essence of an idea of a complex theological topic or something in the Bible. And I found that really refreshing because he was great at asking questions. And then I think he found our conversations helpful. Mm -hmm. And so that just kind of began what was on and off through the years, just conversations that once I finished my way too long education and moved back to Portland, the Bible Project was just born out of us wanting to talk about the things we're making videos about. And then John's ability to synthesize it into these short explanations that could be animated. So it, um, the project that we're working on together is truly like the this combination of our different personalities and strengths. It's been a really fun process. Mm. All right, so just, just in a couple of sentences, describe for our folks what the Bible Project is and what it is exactly that you're doing. Uh, yeah, it's um, we primarily make uh, explainer videos that walk through the Bible, um, specifically through how each book of the Bible is designed as literature, so the literary design and then also we look at biblical themes and we make explainers that weave that theme through the entire biblical storyline um so they're they're like we're trying to help you see uh the bible as a unified story that leads to jesus appreciate it as literature um and yeah. and so these videos become uh, hmm. uh a great kind of introduction to ideas that you can go deeper into. Yeah, um, yeah. And then we go deeper into it in our podcast. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to start, Tim's going to start teaching classes through the Bible Project. So it's it's uh, it's a whole now kind of educational nonprofit. Yep. Yeah. Wow. And it's gotten pretty big. Like you were, we, we were talking earlier, like you've got, it started with the two of you guys, right? Yeah. And then, and then now it's 30 people and a $5 million a year budget, right? Yeah. Yeah, 30 people, uh, most like half of the team is designers, yeah. um, artists, illustrators. Um, and then what's because it's all funded through, um, you know, the average gift is $20 a month. There's like thousands of people who are like part of it. It's a big crowdfunded effort. In fact, it's probably one of the biggest crowdfunding huh. ongoing projects huh. um, around. And so then we have a kind of a whole support staff around that too. And then we're starting to translate into other languages and p pick up this classroom thing. Um, so we've kind of built mm. the team around that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But at, at, the core, at the core of it is John and I, I just read stacks of books <laughs> on different topics. And then John and I sit here in front of these microphones and just talk for hours. Yeah. And that's how every video begins mm -hmm. is me creating like what, just like I'd create a class. But John is my student. <laughs> yes. And then the output isn't like a paper. It's these videos um, and the podcast conversation. So for me, it's a dream come true because it's like being a research professor, um, but without having to grade any papers. <laughs> right. Or, 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 or attend faculty meetings. Or attend faculty yeah, meetings. That's true. Yeah. So it's, I think for both of us, it's been this amazing gift. And too. I get to make videos and I don't have any clients. Yeah, that's right. And yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because previous to this, I did the same kind of work in um, the marketplace. So for mm. um, other nonprofits, which was usually a lot of fun, and then tech companies and all sorts of different services and softwares. 
yeah. and such right. things. You know, there's this unfortunate uh, stereotype of fives, the observers, these yeah. people who um, are often perceived as being loners because often they are, yeah. um, mm -hmm. as being uh, emotionally distant, mm. um, maybe reticent about jumping in and participating in life, uh, mm. opting more to uh, watch it from a distance. You know, I, I like to think of like, I think Jane mm -hmm. Goodall to me, you know, the anthropologist, she sort of like embodies fiveness, you know, yeah. Like that yeah. just, you know, on her own, out in the woods, just observing, watching carefully, recording, you know, and of course a lot of fives do that. But what people don't realize is that some of our greatest tech and, and some of our greatest pioneers uh, in business and in film and other places have been fives because mm. you guys are amazing pioneers mm. Mm. well thank you <laughs> <laughs> amazing uh yeah you know I, uh we're just having a good time yeah. and uh w w we have the privilege of getting to do what we love to do um but but i'm glad that it can be helpful for others and it does seem that we've discovered how to communicate biblical theology through this medium ha hasn't quite been done before so mm -hmm. it's been a fun thing to learn about and explore together yeah well yeah. well lest people think that you know the two of you are just you know bible project guys at least one of you was a card counter once mm. I, yep <laughs> so let's I, let's just get down to what's yeah let's just really get down to what <laughs> let, let's leap behind ezekiel yeah, that, and that. isaiah just for a moment yeah, and get down to, let's get down to the core issue of character let's just forget about personality <laughs> and, and because this is such a five thing John, am I right? Because Mike Pacquiao is the one who told me this. Yeah. Uh, that that you were a card counter, like a like a casino card counter. Is that is that For, right? Yeah, I played on a, a professional blackjack team that counted cards, and that was probably hmm. that was a long time ago. Oh, so five, oh six, oh seven, maybe hmm. ish. I don't know. Yeah. Um, there's a there's a documentary it used to be on Netflix about the team I played on called Holy Rollers. It's it was a it was most of everyone was on the team was actually a follower of Jesus. So it was a really interesting story of all these Christian card counters. Um, I, you know, I don't know if being a five mm. helped me be able to do it or not. Mm. Um, because mm. card counting actually is fairly straightforward. You just have to put in the discipline to learn it. Um, <laughs> I don't think you, it's a, but you, you do have to, um, it's a, it's a very cerebral thing. Uh, so that's, you know, yeah. but you know, I could see, I could see any type doing it. <laughs> uh, so let me just by way of being, you know, being instructive here, I can just assure you there is not one Enneagram four card counter anywhere in the world. <laughs> totally, John. Yeah. Yeah. The, when you were said like, I'm not sure there's anything connected to five personality types. I'm like, you're well, ki you're kidding. There, I'm sure there was fours on the team. I'm sure. Oh, interesting. I'm sure of it. Oh uh, yeah. Um, yeah. You'd be surprised. Uh, you know, it traditionally would draw a uh, a very certain type of person, but because we were like it was a friend network, being like, "Oh, hey, would you want to do this with us?" It wasn't, you know, because I know you and trust you. There's a lot of money changing hands, so the most important thing is you you trust your teammates. Um, so yeah, we would train anyone, and I think Ian, you'd be able to do it if you spent a month practicing. <laughs> Um, and, uh, I don't know if you'd enjoy it, but I think you could do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do, I think actually there, there, there has to be some level of, of, of a need to be somewhat dispassionate in the moment, you know? It, it, yeah. You, yeah. Huh. You know, it, it's not something you run on feelings. No, no, there's no feelings involved. In fact, you have to check your feelings at the door because one of the things that's happening is, um, the casino doesn't want you there. And so you're in an environment where you're not where you're not wanted, and that's really hard to be in that environment. You're just like, as soon as they know what I'm up to, I'm the bad guy, and they're gonna kick me out. Now it's not illegal. It's you know you're not doing anything wrong, but the casino has the right to refuse service, and they will refer, refuse service to you once they find out what you're doing. So uh, if you're if you are very much like. I want to be loved and known and um, be <laughs> friends with everyone. Like you're gonna hate it. You're gonna hate it. And um, I'm a pretty 
I'm a pretty dispassionate five when I, if mm. I, you know, I could be really disconnected mm. and it was still hard for me mm. um, to do that. Mm. Well, that's interesting. So now here you are, you're at the, you're at the Bible project and you've got 30 people working for you. Now, yeah. the, again, thinking about type for a moment, most fives, you know, um, would not enjoy or a lot. I mean, huh. I, you know, I'm not sure if I could say that universally, but, but, I think on the whole, most fives would not like 30 mm. people reporting to them or mm. asking questions mm. or wanting to be, you know, mm. get time with them or mm. because mm. fives typically in the relational sphere, that's where they are most skittish. Mm -hmm. um, they're like, you know, how much is this going to require of me in terms of energy and attention? Yes. Yep. Um, so you got 30 people now. You've grown this yeah. thing. How has that evolved for you? How hard has that been or how great has it been? Well, I think I've screwed up something because, you know, I, I init initially when we were building this, I mean, this is like the third or fourth, I mean, it depends on how you count kind of company I've been a part of building. Huh. And, um, when I, when we were kind of getting the Bob project off the ground, there's a guy in California who writes books. He's got this little consultancy kind of thing. Scazzaro? Yes. Who am I thinking mm -mm. of? Um, mm -mm. Uh, Pete? Pete Scazzaro? Yeah. Not Pete Scazzaro. Not Pete Scazzaro. The Scazzaro. Lencioni. Patrick Lencioni. Lencioni. Patrick oh, yeah, Lencioni. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, um, he, and I love his... He's got this small little operation, probably like half a dozen people. And I don't know if he's a five, but he strikes me as a five. And I was like, that's the kind of business you need to build. Because there's not very many people reporting to you. Um, but you can still have a lot of impact the way that he does it. Yeah, We didn't end up building that. No, there's a lot more people... <laughs> But uh, we brought on a guy named Josh, who's the VP now, and he, basically everyone reports to him. Yeah. And then I get to yeah. Um. Uh, just hear from him how things are going. Yeah. Uh, which he's new. He's been on for like eight months, so we're kind of he's getting yeah. getting his sea legs. But uh, it's in, it's that was an important learning because for a whole season of the project. Um, you were going crazy, yeah, because of this very thing you're talking about, Ian. Um, where he was both simultaneously helping run and manage the organization as it grew, and he and I need all this one on one time to work on the content that makes the whole thing go. And uh, so bringing on somebody to actually run and manage it was absolutely crucial. I, on the other hand, have very few employable skills <laughs> when, <laughs> when, when it comes to like running or leading anything. Yeah. And so no one's ever asked me to do that. They just, <laughs> I just get to be in a corner reading and writing. <laughs> yeah. So I, I actually do kind of play that role of like the guy in the corner and uh, I have to, yeah, I have to turn on the inner switch to be like, Monday is team day and yeah. production meeting day. And I'm going to be with people all day. Whew, here I go. <laughs> and like, that's Mondays. Yeah. And then the rest of the week I get to be in my happy space. Um, yeah. But John's in a little bit different of yeah. a role having. It's to... not ideal. And I don't think I would have done it except for I felt a calling to do it. Um, mm. Particularly the last couple businesses I was in, I was part of mm. the vision of the company, mm. but then I quickly handed off all of the um mm. authority mm. and um mm. yeah. leadership and basically was just became just a creative just like let me be creative you guys run the business and what i found was i'm way too picky about um uh. the kind of business i want to work in <laughs> to let like i just got too dissatisfied both times um to where I just was like, man, I think I have to lead something even though I don't want to. Yeah. So this has been a season of yeah. kind of reluctant leadership. Leadership. <laughs> and I I and I think I think hmm. it's it's been good, mm -hmm. but it's also been very hard and not what I would typically want to do. Mm -hmm. mm. So you guys came to the Enneagram together or separately? And mm. Mm. yeah, tell me a little bit about that journey and what it what mm. it's done for you. Mm. Uh, separately. I think separately, but both connected to our wives and both around the same period yeah. of time, yeah, I sure. think. Yeah. Yeah. For, uh, for me, it was my, uh, wife, uh, I forget how she heard about it through a friend, 
and then um, just kind of uh, read some stuff online. Thought it was, you know, when you first discover anything that's like a personality tool, there's kind of a fun discovery phase. Mm-hmm. But as she began to learn about it and learn about herself, like she really had some important uh, moments of self discovery, and that compelled her to go on a uh, a weekend retreat at a retreat center here outside of Portland. And then she came back from that weekend and we began to have these conversations and, you know, I began to learn about it and man, really, for me, it was a tool to help unlock some really undiscovered territory in my own temperament and value system that I had been living out of, but didn't know how to name or pay attention to or honor. And so it's been pretty, pretty help, very transformative tool for for mm. me and my marriage and discovering why I do the weird behaviors that I do. <laughs> okay, so so let me let me let me just ask you a question about that. You yeah. because the phrase undiscovered territory that's a mm. Mm. that shim, that shimmers a little bit. Mm. Mm. Um mm. what what undiscovered I mean, you know, what what undiscovered territory are you just are you just are you describing there? What yeah. You? Uh well, a part of it was matched with my own vocational journey. Um so you know, I go from skateboarding uh, to biblical studies in this small community of skater Bible nerds. And I pretty much, you know, I, I really resonate with the the core, you know, fives are part of the fear, fear triad. And so from my, you know, youngest years, I remember having existential angst about the meaning of my life <laughs> <laughs> um, and whether I did anything that m- mattered. And in fact, that was a really crucial part of me becoming a follower of Jesus was coming to the nihilistic cliff and recognizing that I had no grounds for any value or meaning in my life. But Jesus is compelling to me. And so that was a key part was like. (laughs) That's okay. It was just that little part about nihilistic cliff and, you know, nothing important. Nothing important. Um, (laughs) Back back on it. Yeah. So, um. Uh, that f- that fear of life having no meaning uh, for me was super crucial as a motivating factor. And I think transferred that focus and energy that I'd given to skateboarding wholly through my teens just into discovering the Christian tradition and the Jewish tradition through the Bible and, and biblical theology. So um, where, where am I going? I'm trying to remember why, why I'm, why I'm t- well, telling the story no, but, right now. But I think you're really actually, you're teasing something out. For- oh, the fear, the fear triad. Yes. Yes, go ahead. Yeah. My greatest fear is that my life has no meaning. Mm. And so uh, once um, I was able to see that so much of my creative energy and my insatiable di- desire to know, and then it's, it's kept getting more focused and focused. Like at first it was Bible, theology, and philosophy. Then it was like, well, philosophy, yeah, that takes a whole lifetime. I'll just do the Bible and theology. <laughs> yeah, because And then it's like, well, Bible and theology, I, I, Bible, history, language. Okay, I think I can maybe do that in a lifetime's worth yeah. of time. And yeah. now I can see like, oh, there's, I can only barely scratch the surface. But what's driving that? And it's been so helpful for me to just, it's my fear, my mm. fear coping mechanism. Um, is mastering this body of knowledge so that I can make a meaningful contribution mm. to the world is my way of coping with my fear of lack of meaning. And that was a, that was a light bulb moment for me. Mm. It really helped me understand my perpetual time scarcity mentality mm. and my, my inclination towards reading insatiably. <laughs> and never feeling prepared enough for any of the projects that we're making. I'll, so it's very helpful for identifying. That's just one aspect, but that's been a key a key one for me. Mm. So let me just, I want to just t- touch on something there. Like the whole idea of nihilism. I mean, I'm yeah. just thinking about how fives, if you're, if you're by nature a somewhat dispassionate, investigative kind of person, yeah. yeah. And you just face the facts objectively as they present themselves to you. It would be pretty easy to reach the edge of the cliff, like, yeah. like, yeah. You, you know what I mean? Like, oh, in yeah. other words, like, you know, as a four, you know, if I get too close to the cliff, I can write a poem. 
You know what I mean? <laughs> and, and you yeah. know, I feel like, oh, there's some meaning and some beauty and, you know, but like, man, if it's just cold steel, you know, and you're just like, this is how it is. Mm. You could get to a dark place pretty fast as a five, mm -hmm. right? I mean, yeah. fives naturally could go there. Yeah. Yeah. I I've definitely met darker versions <laughs> of my own kind of temperament before. Um, and I, I actually do turn to the arts, uh, to visual arts and music in those darker seasons. They are really important to me in terms of rediscovering some kind of transcendence. Mm. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's, on, it's ever present. Every day I wake up and make a decision to adopt a Christian worldview. Um, it's a choice. And I, I was just spent a weekend camping with my kids and I just can't, it's always humming in the background. I'm like playing and having a time in my life. And in the back of my mind, I'm going, Does this, is this real? Is this just an illusion? Wow. Is this just chemicals in my mind <laughs> that I'm enjoying my son so much right now? <laughs> hugging him. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm hugging my son and having this wonderful moment. And in the back of my mind, I'm going, this, this could all be meaningless. <laughs> wow. uh, it's so weird. I have to like put a muffler on it <laughs> to like make it be more quiet. Mm -hmm. So learning to just identify that and that's an animal that's got to be tamed. Uh, and not letting it take over my mental energy and, and instead channeling my mental energies towards something more productive. But uh, yeah, that's some, the, the whole being, just knowing that fear, that fear, there's a scared little Tim under there. Mm. <laughs> so helpful for me. It's, that's been mm. a really important uh, self-discovery. So how about, well, let me just add, I want to, don't worry, John, coming back to you. But Tim, yeah, the, no the, I, I just think about Nietzsche and I yeah. think about yeah. these people who had, it's almost like um, uh, they were almost too realistic. Mm, mm -hmm. um, and I don't know very much about Nietzsche's personality or about, I mean, I've, I've read some Nietzsche, but I've, I'm just thinking in that, in that realm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's, he, he may not be the right person to hang my hat on right now, mm. but they had such a clear view of things mm. and mm. the clarity was crushing. Mm. Uh, for mm -hmm. because of its fact because of its facticity you know what i mean like it was just yeah. it was well, just yeah. like you or know apparent facticity i mean <laughs> yes or, okay okay it's apparent facticity but yeah. i guess the the thing is for a five yeah is like i can see where man you could really yeah i mean like depression um yeah. yes. and a darkness that's like yeah you know if this is objective reality then there's you can't fight with reality so you know yeah. yeah, you either figure it out or perish underneath yeah. the weight of it. Yeah, I, I do. I did have a season of reading enough postmodern literary philosophy in college that I am armed enough to doubt my doubts, <laughs> mm. uh, to to undermine my skepticism. Mm. Yeah, um, because nihilism itself, as a philosophical movement, is actually making a number of real positive truth claims about our ability to know and evaluate mm -hmm. the true situation of the human predicament. And those themselves are the very moves that uh, postmodern philosophy undermines, our ability to know anything at all. So my, my nihilism more tends to go, it's just like, it's really self-focused. It's just like, is, is any of this real? <laughs> Am I just living, I might be a, a brain in a vat for all I know right now. Right. <laughs> but, so, uh, you know, it doesn't yeah. seem like it, so I guess I'll enjoy it today and just block those thoughts. <laughs> yeah, that's almost like a five that's observing yeah. the observing. Yeah. It's almost like, <laughs> yes, yeah, it's so meta. <laughs> you but know, it's like, it's yeah. amazing. Yeah, totally. I, yeah, it's really, yeah, yeah. I have to actively um, tame that right. you, whole Yeah, that you got to come part. back to the moment. Yeah, that's right. Well, I think one that's thing right. that a five is good at, from what I understand, is that um, is being a good neutral party mm. in discerning what is actually true, what is to be mm. the, to be the fact of of a matter, um, and and as much as you can figure that out. Yeah, and um, and I think most humans have a very uh, useful kind of defense mechanism or just uh, ability to to filter things through our minds in such a way that we just kind of see what we've already wanted to see mm. and ignore what doesn't mm -hmm. fit mm. and c create these kind of coherent narratives about everything and feel really safe and secure in them. Mm -hmm. Where I think a five is more apt to mm -hmm. kind of look around the corner and go, well, what's going on over there? And, and really easily get 
yeah. discombobulated yeah. And, and start to wonder if they're yeah. just a brain in a vat. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So maybe just to, um, I did a number of different kind of trials. I did academic and tried academic teaching for a while. I was in local church ministry. And both of those environments actually were really end up ending up being challenging in the long run. And so to me, this project and working with John has been such a gift because he and I are similar enough that we just kind of get how each other exists in the world. <laughs> Um, but I'm able to channel this thing that c could come from a, a, a real dark place inside of me, mm -hmm. but I'm able to ch channel it and, um, at least try <laughs> and put it in the service of discipleship to Jesus. And it's, it's been able to have this really amazingly, uh, productive contribution, at least it seems to, to, uh, whatever the world and uh it's just been the greatest surprise because i never mm. thought that my obsession with trying to understand the history of the bible and where it came from and how it communicates and that that could actually be useful <laughs> so it's this weird it, it's this wonderful kind of redemption experience of watching what i can now see came from a place of fear for so many years driving me to learn and to know is actually able to be put into the service as something good. And f for me, that's been a real beautiful grace kind of experience. Mm. I'm thinking about right now about In the Great Divorce, um, you know, which I'm working on a book right now and uh, using some sections of it because it's so good. Um, and, you know, we know, of course, the very famous scene of the guy who is, uh, for those of you who don't know, he, it's about a bus trip to hell literally yeah. it's a bunch of yeah. people angels or heavenly beings that have gone to hell to try and talk people into yeah. letting go of their attachments yeah. right letting go of whatever has gotten hold of them and in one of the great scenes in that book there's a guy who struggles with lust and he's got this sort of lizard on his shoulder and i don't think lewis is trying to say that that's how the the spiritual world actually looks or functions he's just you know it's you know it's a story so yeah uh, the angel keeps saying, let me kill it. Let me kill it. And the guy and the, the little demon is whispering in the guy's ear. No, don't let him do it. You can't live without me. You can't live without me. You know, and, and finally he, he says, yes, you know, kill it. And of course it's excruciating yes. and painful. Yes. But what happens to the, to the, it's like a serpent, right? Like a little mm. mini dragon or something. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. A little mm -hmm. sulfur spitting something. Mm -hmm. And, uh, the, it transforms into a beautiful, as I recall, white horse. Yes. Yes upon which the guy rides off yeah. and to me that's kind of what you're describing yeah. right which yeah, is that's right that you know this this gift this you know can be a dark thing on my shoulder yeah and and it could be something that in its unredeemed state could kill me yeah but as it's used in service to a larger program of redemption of advancing god's uh, love into the world it actually can be parlayed or flipped on its head and it turns out to be the very thing that i can run away on like a white horse yeah. to, to transport me it's wonderful yeah yeah that's a great uh visual metaphor <laughs> from mm -hmm. John my experience with uh biblical theology yeah. <laughs> that's wonderful yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, hey, John, I'm going to circle to you in just one moment because I want to ask you the same question that I, I just spent some time with Tim on, which is like, you know, how the Enneagram, how'd you learn about it? Uh, you know, what, you know, kind of what, what has the impact been, a, been of it on your, on your life? Before we do, though, I need to talk about the uh, sponsor for today's typology. It's, uh, it's called Restoring the Soul. And, um, I'm a therapist and I'm a, a spiritual director and, you know, so I am somebody who really does believe in the power of being in a room with somebody else trying to, you know, uh, figure out what's happening in, in your life and what it means and, uh, and where it's going. And, you know, in my experience, uh, people come to therapy and they come weekly, they, sometimes they come for years and the process goes pretty slow. Um, and some people just don't have the luxury of that time. They've got some fires burning somewhere in their life and they really have to get on it and they got to get on it quick. And so I've become a fan of these intensive counseling sessions that my friend, Mike Cusick at Restoring the Soul in Colorado does. He's been doing these for 20 years. Folks come in for day long or often week long or two week long chunks of time to, uh, 
to do some really intensive work to get at core issues that are going on in their lives so that they can really, you know, kind of um, uh, become their, you know, best expression of, of who they are as, as human beings. And I just, I can't commend them enough. They are an amazing, amazing uh, organization. Um, so I want to just encourage anybody out there who's listening right now to consider if you're in a place in your life where you're like, man, I got to get at some core stuff that's happening. I got to, I got to figure me out uh, in a hurry or just, you know, you've had longstanding issues that require attention and, and, you know, you've been plodding along, but you know, it hasn't been uh, as uh, fruitful or as, uh, you know, uh, it's not evidencing everything that you'd hoped. Then you need to get a hold of uh, my friend, Mike Cusick at restoring the soul. You can give him a call at 303 nine three two nine seven 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 and learn how their intensive counseling process can jumpstart your journey and as a special bonus just for typology listeners uh you can go to www.restoringthesoul.com forward slash typology to download mike's pdf called five ways to unaddressed trauma may be derailing your relationship five ways unaddressed trauma may be derailing your relationship and i just encourage you to check them out you could go out to denver and you know be in the mountains do your work and uh i'm telling you it'll be life change for you so restoring the soul.com michael cusick 93 that's at 303-932-9777 Whew, that was a lot to get out <laughs> all right john to you my friend what um What's your journey been like with the Enneagram and what, how, how did this all come about that you uh, are using it in your own spiritual formation? Yeah, I don't remember how I first really came into touch with it. I know me and my wife were really um, into Myers-Briggs as a way to talk about personality um, as, for our whole marriage. I've been married for 15 years and that had just been the, the way we talked about hmm. this kind of thing. And then Enneagram in the last few years has become the way everyone around me is talking about it. <laughs> and, um, and so I just started to learn about it and adopt that paradigm for kind of having these conversations. And in doing so, I found it very useful. I, I found the five type for me makes a lot of sense of a lot of my habits and my, my way of being in the world, um, particularly in how cerebral i am like how just in my head mm. i constantly am to the point where i actually kind of think of myself like a brain in a jar or like a head on a stick <laughs> <laughs> kind of person um i i think of myself as just kind of like this purely rational just kind of observing the observer is the perfect way to, to yeah. talk about it. Like, huh. so I grew up in the Christian church or uh, in a kind of evangelical church. So, you know, think of, of a typical church service where half of it or so is going to be people singing songs to God and there's rock and roll or le something <laughs> less than rock and roll or whatever's <laughs> happening. Um, for me, I, I'm completely, I like to disassociate during that time. And I'm just kind of observing from some like just uh purely rational place um and that's the same thing from like a lot of social interactions um i just it just kind of like i feel like i escape my body and i'm just in my head um it'll cause me to neglect my body um hunch forget to eat ignore pain um like I just want to kind of just be mm. a brain. Mm. And so that helped me understand where that's all coming from. Mm. Um, and uh, another really thing that helped me a lot was um, uh, the five, the, the, the vice connected to it is greed. Yeah. Avarice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Avarice. And mm. um, man, at first I was like, yeah, this is another reason why I have a few reasons why I felt like I, I'm not a five. There was a few things that weren't really matching. And this was one of them. I was like, I'm not a greedy person. I wouldn't think of myself as greedy and I have my own problems, but I don't know if that greed would be the one, but then it's, uh, but it clicked recently in the way that, that I think Andrew Graham talks about it is I'm really greedy when it comes to my own energy, mm. specifically when mm -hmm. it comes to social energy. Mm -hmm. Like I am so greedy. Like, mm -hmm the 
uh, I will neglect friendships. Mm-hmm. I will escape and get my own personal time. Um, and I'm not worried about who that's affecting. <laughs> uh, we have young kids, so that affects my wife a lot. And um, that's a form of greed. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I know exactly what you're talking. About. I could be very, but I love to be generous in other ways. But man, yeah, I'm greedy about that kind of stuff. Yeah, um, and that's helpful for me to to, mm-hmm. to keep in mind. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's yeah. Uh, you, you know, one of the things I love about fives is <laughs> there's always the long pauses. <laughs> yeah, it's usually. It's usually five seconds after I like, so as a, like, uh, in my, when I was, you know, working, you know, as a priest for, for my, you know, as my whole life, uh, or as a therapist, you know, if I, if I had someone that would, you know, I could probably guess was a five. I knew when I answered a question, I had to wait 10 seconds for the answer Yeah, and I couldn't get anxious. I just had to <laughs> yeah. sit and wait and wait yeah. because you guys just have so many files in your brains. You're like going, your, your search engine is looking for the answer <laughs> yeah. and you're so, and there's so much stuff to sift through and then you don't want to sound dumb. You might, no. you want to make it sound yeah. just right. Yeah. Uh, so that you don't appear inept or inadequate. So it's totally, like, totally. You, you, then you're formulating and then, yeah. so I just sit and wait, you know, uh, you know, if I get a four in the office, I get like more words per minute than I can, I can shake a stick at. <laughs> if I got a five in the office, I got 20 minutes of silence and 30 minutes of talking. Yeah, totally. It's fantastic. <laughs> that's, that's totally right. Yeah, so the- your marriages, like, like, like Tim, what, what, what number is your wife? Uh, she is very clearly a one. Ah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Reformer and, slash improver. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. Improvers. Yeah. Yep. I like that word. Don't you? That's yeah. a good word. Yeah. Uh, I think it's a, it's a generous title because every part of my life is improved by her presence. <laughs> Usually through Whether some, you want it or not. Whether I want it or not. <laughs> yeah. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Totally. yeah. <laughs> she's a, she's a, a, an incredible human being, an mm. amazing human being. Um, wow. And- Whereas I'm just kind of fine detaching and observing, letting things, you know, develop and unfold. Mm. For her, n- n- no, no thing in our lives is adequate. It can all be critiqued, retro, engineered, and then improved. <laughs> mm. Wow, <laughs> uh, which for okay. me is exhausting. But for her, that's what makes life awesome: is being able to do that to every part of her life. Mm. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. I, and, and John, what's your what's your wife's number? My wife's a two. Ah, so, okay. And she's and she's a counselor by trade, and and yeah, she <clears throat> just loves mm. to 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 get really intimate with people emotionally, intellectually, and and try to solve problems and fix people. And mm. I'm I'm a project too. I feel like <laughs> in that regard, yeah. Um, which is good. I mean, and it's it's created the right types of. Uh, problems for us because I want to just be detached. Um, I want to distrust emotions. I want her to distrust emotions because I do. Mm-hmm. That's the best way to live. <laughs> and um, and she wants m- me to understand the value of emotions and to be able to be emotional. And it's just this perfect kind of yeah. chaos that's <laughs> refining us both. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, so for you guys personally, and maybe just in generally about fives, right? Like, what is it about feelings or emotions? Let's, let's give it a better word. That mm. uh, is so um, threatening, maybe. Mm. Yeah. I, I have a short answer. And actually, I know John has a, a longer, better answer. Okay. <laughs> You've been giving a lot more thought. But I think about it a lot. I just, I noticed that when... I let myself give in to an emotion. Um, what I experience as productivity or something helpful or useful to me or the world is almost never the result. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's my experience wow. of emotions uh, is when I've let myself feel that all the way to the bottom, even make a decision based on that. I usually always look back and be like, oh, gosh, why did I do that? Or Mm. that was ill-informed because I wasn't disengaging and weighing the pros and cons. I just let myself feel sad and then make a... It it feels like it makes me 
uh, drive towards uninformed decisions. So you're, and, you're and that's being, how I experience it. And I, you're anyway. being more self aware than I ever was, ah, in ah. that I wouldn't even be able to tell you I was acting emotionally. Ah. Um, when I was acting emotional. Oh, interesting. I You didn't even experience I, your emotions as emotions. No, in fact, I'm still <laughs> learning yeah. how to do that, yeah. which is strange place to be in when you're ah. in your late 30s because these are the things you should probably learn like when you're seven years old, mm. you know, or five years old, like like this is what anger feels like. This is what sadness feels like. Mm. Um, and, those, and I'm actually just in the last year appreciating that. Mm. Um, mm. Like, oh, I'm angry. I'm having this... I'm having this daydream about this this thing and this that feeling accompanying it that's anger that I'm feeling um huh. before I would just ignore it and I would pretend I didn't have feelings because for me the fear is that the feeling's going to make me make a wrong decision yeah and it's not trustworthy yeah and so if I make a decision without an emotion I can trust that decision yeah um that's the paradigm I've come from I've, I've had a complete flip um to where I now think about emotions like information and they need to be part of my decision making process um and but you, that's really you found a way to <laughs> yeah i found a way to cerebralize, cerebralize your emotions it. yeah to factor them into your brain processing yeah because i still live in my brain i mean yeah, yeah and we yeah. all do we all like yeah. have our conscious experience yeah yeah which but they is, are they're signals they're signals our body's giving us signals yeah that we we shouldn't ignore. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, John, what's your wing? Uh, six. Yeah. And I think. I mean, oh, I don't know entirely. Okay. Because I have a very um, strong kind of creative oh. bent. Mm -hmm. That's right. And actually, um, John has a, um, a real lack of fear. Oh, he is yeah. not risk averse in many ways, as yeah. I've discovered. Uh, and so uh, that's been interesting. Cause yeah, that's one thing I can't relate to with the five mm. is, and I think it just might be a malfunction that I have biologically, <laughs> <laughs> is that I just don't get afraid of the right things. Um, <laughs> but that's uh, called judgment, John. Yeah. <laughs> well, Again, separate from personality a little bit, right? Maybe. Uh, I feel like it's part of my personality too, though. Huh. Um, but maybe it is um, just judgment. But yeah, uh, the six the six wing is probably more where I would land. Mm. Um, but uh, but I can I can identify with both four and six. Okay, and then what about you, Tim? Uh, oh, definitely the f five with the six mm -hmm. wing. I, I um, yeah, yep. Yeah, we both have a lot of loyalty. Um, mm. Mm. I think. But, but but in terms of me uh, moving towards. Uh, a disposition that's planning and anticipating the disastrous outcome oh. <laughs> and then out yeah. of fear yeah. and then that of fear um and uh, totally that's um i'm super risk averse yeah and um i hate it when i end up in a complex difficult situation because i'm like dang it if i would have been smart enough i would never even be in the situation yeah, in the first place yeah i identify with that uh yeah. so i plan to avoid anything that places me in a risky even scenario but i've found that rationally it doesn't make sense to be afraid of that ultimately because mm, at mm, a certain point mm. you just have no more control yeah and um yeah and yeah, yeah. i think this actually plays in the card counting like card counting is all about um it's all about statistics it's all about you're getting a half a percentage edge over the house and over a thousand hands you're going to reap the benefit of that. But in any one given hand, mm. any one given scenario, you're going to win or lose, and it doesn't matter if you played it right. Mm. Um, but over time, it, it, it matters. And I think, and I, I wonder if it's a five trait in that I like to think statistically. Mm. So where people are like, get freaked out about certain things, like, like um, I, I like to constantly compare people's fears to like how likely they are to die versus like driving. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Because people aren't afraid yeah. to drive around in their cars. It's one of the most dangerous things you do ever. Yeah. And um, you do it so nonchalantly yeah. and bravely. And then you're afraid to of, get on an airplane. To get on an well, airplane right. is a perfect <laughs> yeah, example. Yeah. And you're yeah. way less likely or, or afraid of all sorts of crazy scenarios where it's like no one's going to get hurt. Like the chances are now someone could, mm -hmm. but like. It, to me, it just doesn't make sense to live with that fear. Mm. So, like, I kind of just, mm. mm -hmm. I, I can't. Mm -hmm. John and I are about to take our families 
to the place in Eastern Oregon called Cougar Lake. <laughs> oh, yeah. And there are cougars. And the one number one thing on my mind is that my kids are little and there are cougars. <laughs> it's, the, it's the number one thing on my mind for the four-hour drive out there. I told John this, and yeah. John's like, oh, it didn't even occur to me. <laughs> yeah. To, that thought didn't even occur to you. No. No. I think it would be fun to, like, have a cougar get really close to us. <laughs> yeah. Because well, then you'd have a cool story. Yeah. Well, you know, he's a tough guy. He was a rollerblader, dude. <laughs> yeah, just, yeah. Okay. He could club him with his wheeled boot. Yeah, yeah, that, was, <laughs> that was a moment of vulnerability. <laughs> club the mountain lion. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I'm taking advantage of your vulnerability. Yeah. I apologize. All right, yeah, well, now, sorry. okay, so <laughs> speaking of vulnerability, um, now that I've made it very safe here for you to be honest about who you are, um, <laughs> like, John, what was the, when was the last time in your life or can you name a moment in your life when now give me the last time i'm going to put you on the spot when you know um your mental faculties were of no use your heart was just broken hmm. wow wow <laughs> yeah that's, that's a great question hmm. um the last time um yeah you know i mean this is something i've been working on a lot um specifically with my wife working through these things and i've been putting into practice trying to let myself just feel specific, specifically around her uh as, as one of the safer places to do that and um and yeah like there was trying to remember the exact situation but she just she did something that just really bummed me out and i think typically i would get really kind of argumentative and antagonistic and i would try to just prove to her that she wronged me but instead i just felt kind of defeated and i and and i just kind of let myself just be bummed <laughs> <laughs> And that was probably like a few months ago. And that's mm. that's really rare mm -hmm. for me. Mm. Mm. Um, mm. And, uh, you know, that would happen as a kid, too. I just, I'd just i get really flustered. But I always found that if I just went to bed the next morning, I'd totally forget why I was angry. <laughs> 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 like, I'd get huh. really mad at my mom or something. I'd go to huh. bed just steaming. And the next morning, I'd be like, yeah. totally forgot. The emotions were gone. And yeah. I could live the next day, like, with fresh emotions. <laughs> <Huh>. <laughs> Useful skill. Yeah. 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 Well, you know, it's interesting. I, I, I've, I was the, in a counseling dangerous. session. I was in a counseling session with a, uh, a five once and he was married to a two and, and, you mm. know, she kept talking about feelings and he kept kind of like getting on her saying, well, you know, those are fine. Feelings are all fine and good, but here are the facts. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And finally, I just, I had to look at him and say, you know, so-and-so feeling is a way of thinking. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's not. You know, I think a five when they're unhealthy tends to think that it's, you know, um, subordinate or somehow it's 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 uh, a lesser intelligence. But feeling is not a lesser intelligence. It's just a different way of thinking, actually. Yeah, totally. Mm -hmm. uh, it is. And like I said, I like to think of feelings as information. Um, I, the way I like to think about it now is that your body, you know, you... Um, you're receiving millions of bits of information every second through your five senses. Um, and, uh, and you don't have the conscious bandwidth to process all of that. It's just impossible. In fact, um, arguably what kind of scientists think is that sim somewhere around 20 bits per second can you consciously process millions of bits you're coming in and so what your body's doing is it's filtering all that information and it's trying to bring up to your to your conscious thinking mm -hmm. um and alert you of things that you should pay attention to mm -hmm. but what it's doing is it's coding that all that information into uh a feeling because it, huh. that's how it can deliver it yeah. and then you've got to unpack that and then decide uh, what you're going to do with that information um and so it is it's your body thinking for you um, and thinking way harder than you are, <laughs> um, and often is really, really smart. A lot, lots of times can throw you off, um, because it's not perfect, but it's that, you know, when people say they have like, that gut feeling or that instinct, it's your body working for you, 
um, mining all this data. Hmm. Yeah, well, it's it's so important to remember, like you know, because like, I think sometimes the the biggest mistake we can make in life, or one of them anyway, of the many, is to hmm. presume that our way of seeing the world is normal. Mm. Ah, yes. And then, yeah, totally. that, therefore, anyone totally. who sees it differently than we do is either abnormal or stupid. Yeah. And and therefore, we yeah. can you know sort of dim- dismiss their their way of seeing the world, and that's such, that's a cataclysmic mistake, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. self-limiting and so partic- you know potentially destructive. And um, mm-hmm. so I'm always like mm-hmm. when I get someone in my office that is sort of fixated or has a unhealthy mm-hmm. attachment to a particular way of seeing the world that they can't let go of. I'm like, you know, that kind mm-hmm. of rigidity or inflexibility is not a good thing. You know, um, mm-hmm. and of course it can become pathological too. So we, you know, to the point where it's actually nothing much you can do for them really. Um, Tim. I want to ask you the same question. What, mm. what was the last mm. time you encountered something in life where, you know, it basically the your your rational, analytical, discursive your mind could not process it and you know deal with it that way. Yeah. It just bro- something just broke yeah. your heart and you had to live with it. Yeah, um, I have the luxury of having time to think about it that John didn't have <laughs> <laughs> um I, I, two things one t- small as if that feeling is ever small scale or large scale one large scale one was a big relational conflict i had to sort through with somebody that i was really close to and my normal mode of going through that was to just adapt to an unhealthy situation and just interpret it as well it's just how the world is and i can make this work. Uh, but instead, I decided to move towards this um, and begin a long process of lots of difficult conversations. And man, my body just freaked out. <laughs> uh, over the course of about 30 days, I couldn't sleep. I, and when I did, I would have these strange symbolic dreams. <laughs> they were all some kind of like uh, I was alone and I'm having to overcome some horrific obstacle or, you know, face something. And my body was just sorting through sort a relational conflict and having a difficult conversation where I was completely honest about my disappointments with myself and with the situation and the other person. Um, so I, that wasn't necessarily a broken heart, but it was owning my disappointment and guiding my body through the process of feeling that mm. and man it was really intense for me i think for most people that's just like normal you just have conflicts and you talk about them with people <laughs> but for me it became this like drama of a whole month of my life um so that was interesting and i and i still am kind of you know reckoning with the uh all the consequences and and that kind of thing. A smaller scale one, but actually that I felt just as strongly, just for not as long, was actually watching the movie Inside Out with my kids. Oh, yeah, wow. And um, so, I don't know. If people don't know the premise of the movie, it won't make any sense. But uh, there's a character named Bing Bong. (laughs) And Bing Bong is this toy from the main character's childhood. And it's lost in like the recesses of the memory and the memory is this place in the story. And so basically this character dies, is erased, fall, you know, this, it's like a little stuffed toy from this child's childhood. And so I'm watching this movie with my two sons, you know, who are four and six and, uh, and I see myself so much in them physically, I can see myself and I'm just thinking about how Mm. I'm, have all these experiences of what they with of their childhood that they will not remember. It's just lost to history. And then I started to think about how whole portions of my life are just erased. And I was brought to the nihilistic cliff <laughs> while watching Bing Bong die in this movie. <laughs> and so it's me, my sons, and my wife. And I just start to weep uncontrollably. I mean, did. No composure. Um, wow. And... It just, I'm watching this symbolic representation of the erasure of human meaning in life. (laughs) While my boys are sitting next to me and I'm contemplating that in their lives and 
And it was just one of these moments. But the story is so beautiful is that out of that st- story, the, the character comes to embrace a more complex way of understanding their emotions and letting um, these losses and the victories of, of their lives for, form and shape more emotional awareness. Anyway, so that was actually very recent. And it was, I couldn't believe what happened to me. It was like my body was just overtaken by grief mm. and loss. And my wife was just staring at me. I never cry. And uh, she was just like, what on earth is happening? Right are you now? okay? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so there you go. Those are the two things that came well, to my mind. No, I really appreciate it because I think it's, I do think it's important that um, we recognize that there's so much going on in, um, well, maybe to use a language that fives would appreciate, it, like there's so much going on in the operating system we are utterly unaware of. Yeah. And yeah. there are so many things that are, are controlling the strings of our lives that we don't know are. Yeah. Um, yeah. Whether it's, you know, you know, and, and they'll, they, you know, uh, in Jungian psychotherapy, we'd say that, you know, uh, the more of those you can become aware of, the better off you're going to be. Yeah. You know, and, and because they will come out and bite you. Yes. Somewhere down the road, it's not the, your soul is going to keep sending up messages like that one. Yeah. yeah. Um, like, oh, by the way, have you thought about grief recently? Yeah. Um, or loss in your life? Yeah. Um, or, and you guys, how old, John, you're 38? Yeah. Uh, almost. Okay. Yeah. Almost 30. And Tim, Tim, how old are you? 41. 41. Yeah. Okay. So, like, you guys are at a really funny cusp moment in your lives. Yeah. Um, if, you know, uh, the kind of the great spiritual wisdom teachers, I think would say when a lot of what has worked into this point is going to start fraying at the edges and falling apart, Mm. Mm -hmm. you know, where that, because, you know, your, Mm -hmm. your personality, if you think about it, is just in many ways a, you know, it's, yes, it's got temperament and disposition and there are biological things happening and genetic inheritances and all that, but also, you know, it's also a collection of strategies Mm -hmm. that we devise as children, Mm -hmm. uh, ways of being in the world that we think will keep us safe, uh, will win us esteem that will, um, you know, um, Mm -hmm. uh, give us a a sense of control, uh, of ourselves, of the world around us. And, um, eventually they kind of run their course in, and, Mm. and so, you know, often people will say, you know, in the first half of your life, you're, you're basically setting up your ego, building it up. And in the second half of your life, you know, you, it starts to, you start to deconstruct it. You know, it's like, if you're healthy, right. You start to go, gosh, you know, this thinky way that I've gone through life, mm-hmm. this five-ish way of going through life is incomplete. Yeah. Um, or it has not always served me well. And, um, I need to discover other territories. Mm. Um, inside of myself and mm. if i don't uh i will die as well it's 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 not actually something you can get away from but as, yeah. as, yeah. Carl, Ron, yeah. as carl ronner once said right you, we all die unfinished symphonies but you know yeah it would really be nice to die with that symphony a little bit more done than sure. you know the one note i've been playing for the last 30 some odd years yeah um and so you're at that kind of wonderful cusp of moment but it's also very painful yeah um yeah. As you develop mentally, it's a, it is a season of confusion, I think, when yeah. you realize, you know, my personality, my way of being in the world has gotten me this far, but, you know, it's also left me with a profound limp. Yeah. Yeah. And I've, I've got to find my way to a more whole expression of myself because to get a personality means that you had to amputate parts of who you are in order to fit into the world in which you found yourself. Yeah. And that second half, man, is so much of it is about recovering that which you had to delete or that which you had to mm. put aside because the culture or the context or the family in which you found yourself didn't find those things acceptable. Those mm-hmm. parts of you were, you know, like unacceptable, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and if you wanted to get by, you had to throw them into the shadow and yeah. pretend they weren't there. Um, and... Uh, that's why I was asking you about the question about, mm. you know, what what's broken your heart uh, of late, mm. and mm. I'm just wondering, mm. you know, do you feel like you're on the front end of that 
transition or in the middle of it, at the mm. end of it, not there yet? Where, where do you guys <laughs> sit with that? Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, I feel like I want to think about that for another <laughs> couple of days before I respond. <laughs> uh, well, but do you know where I'm coming from when yeah. I say all that? Oh, yes. Yeah, I, um, yeah. I wonder if I should spend the second half of my life deconstructing my ego and or kind of really becoming letting letting a new personality emerge or mm. um or if I just embrace my idiosyncrasies mm. and I'm glad that people love me in spite of them and that God could use them. Um or somewhere in between, obviously. And uh I um I found that um the one area of my life that I neglect that I think I'm going to really regret mm. at the end of my life is relationships mm. because relationships mm. are not an intellectual exercise. Mm. They um, can't be put neatly into boxes. They're messy. They take a lot of time. I always like to think about efficiency of time, <laughs> you know, like mm. Tim often thinks about was this day productive or not. I usually am thinking about that. I'm trying to think of hacks to get through the day faster and more efficient and with relationships it's mm -hmm. just a different mm -hmm. you just can't think that way mm -hmm. um to be known by someone and to know someone else for who they really are and to be known who, who for who you really are um i can easily neglect that and would easily neglect that my whole life um and then really mm -hmm. really regret it mm -hmm. one thing that's saving that is having kids mm -hmm. um because I, I look at these little humans mm. that are going to become adults one day and I'm thinking like <clears throat> my relationship with them is so unique to them. Like I have to figure this out because mm. I, I would be jipping them of, <laughs> of, yeah. of something so important if I'm not close to them relationally. But like I've gone through life with friendships, good friendships, but, um, but not the type of friendships i think you want to end life mm. with um where you're you're feeling really deeply satisfied for having gone through the trenches with people mm. Mm. Uh. Mm. yeah I, I i resonate with that i think uh, parenting coming into season of parenting jessica and i as my wife uh we joke that my education <laughs> my phd was our first child so we uh, uh, start having kids more in our mid to late thirties, and so, um, there is a sense in which my how long does it take to get a PhD and, out of the diaper stage? Yeah, yeah, a long, <laughs> a long, long time. <laughs> um, so in, in many ways, like going through graduate school just cemented me and my neuroses, you know, and and more unhealthy habits. It's not a healthy way of life. Surviving graduate school. And so parenting has been, yeah, this kind of reckoning with the <laughs> the me that's been forming, you know, for the 36 years before I we had uh, our first child. And so, yeah, but the parenting has been really this important uh, season of new self-discovery. And it's just forced me to find tools to help me understand why I behave the way I do towards these little humans that I live with. And... Uh, that's been absolutely crucial. And then, uh, yeah, I guess true, true to form, I totally feel the same way John does. I, I spent seven years in local church ministry having loads of people in my life and breaking down about every six months with anxiety. What I can now see were anxiety attacks. <laughs> 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 and uh, I was just living against the grain of my temperament in that way being available to so many people all the time. And so uh, now being in more in a job where it's just a small group of people that I'm with regularly and I have lots of focus time, that's more healthy. Uh, but I also need to guard that too because I could easily just make that circle go really, really small. And mm. then all of a sudden, uh, six months goes by and I just, when's the last time I went for a walk with a friend? You know, or met somebody for a drink, and uh, and it's not very often. And so, I I really 
need to address that. That's probably the most current issue right now. Same is the hmm. f- friendships that 10 years from now, I won't look back and just be in a relational desert mm-hmm. when it comes to and, uh, deep friendships. Mm. So listen, just in closing, um, I want to ask you guys, um, well, I want to make a statement and then ask you to finish the question. Um, I guess the statement would be, um, I was at a retreat in San Francisco, uh, and it, I, I love to have panels uh, of different types speak about their own experience. And one was an older guy. He was, I don't know, maybe in his 70s, and he was a five. And one of his great, his great, his great regrets was that, um, you know, I think back on all the people who in my life extended the hand of friendship, ex- expressed interest and pursued me, and, mm. and that I managed unconsciously, sometimes consciously, to avoid and he said, and he, in a very, very quiet moment, it was very, very moving, actually. He said, mm. and at 75, I think about how many of them now are gone. Mm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, just feel the room just became very humid with his own sort of sense of regret that mm-hmm. he had not mm-hmm. paid attention mm-hmm. uh, to those signals from, you know, people who wanted to care and support him. And, mm-hmm. and but he just couldn't make the connect uh, mm-hmm. for for whatever reason um mm-hmm. but but and then the the other thing i was going to say was that i think one of the beautiful things i i picked up from this conversation is like you know we are a mixed bag you know you, you, you we tend to want to be very you know our thinking gets very black and white and co- compartmentalized and we think okay well i need to get rid of this personality or i need to you know what i mean it's like it's like mm. well good luck it's mm. like pesto and pasta you know it's yeah. like you know, we are temperament, we are disposition, we are, you know, we are biology, we're genetics, mm. we're wounds, we're, you know, we're all kind. I mean, who the heck knows how we got to be how we are, you know? <laughs> um, and and yet the question at any given moment m- might be, you know, what part of who I am in this moment is of God and which part isn't? Mm. You know, mm. it's like in my relationship with my child, when I act this way, is that of God or is that not? Because it might be at the, it might be at the office, but it may not be at home. Mm. So I think so much of what the Enneagram does is give us information that we use for discernment. Mm. It's like, okay, well, what does love require of me in this moment? Um, does it require for me to be objective and you know, uh, relying on my gift in the as a, as a a really really good thinker? Or does this moment require me to do something really dangerous like uh, call a friend and go for a walk? Mm. You know, those are the disciplines. These are the moments we say, mm. just discerning and not, not allowing yourself to get onto autopilot, you mm. know, mm. but to live uh, with, with more conscious awareness all the time, mm. you know, mm. that seems to me to be wise. So mm. anyway, mm. that's a, that's a, a, a lovely sort of uh, <laughs> outcome of this call I was just thinking, mm. yeah, like to ask myself more and more like, mm. What 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 in my personality, the way I am being in the world at this moment, mm. is of God and what isn't? Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mm. That's a mm. that's a that's a big idea for me mm. right now. Mm. Um, so so in closing, I guess my question to you guys is: So what? You're a five, <laughs> and you're you you self-identify as people of faith. So, I mean, is that just more information? <laughs> <laughs> or is it something you can actually do something with mm. to to more fully embody your true self? And what I mean by that is not mm. I, I mean that in the in the purely Thomas Merton sense of the word mm. that that where mm. you are true self, meaning um, where you are beautifully sh- reflecting the glory of God in your person um, in a way that is unobstructed. You know what I mean? Mm. It's like. The beauty of who you are is unobstructed from the world. Mm. Um, like, so is it, is mm. this just information, or is this something you mm. you can mm. work into the the development of your own soul? Like, what? Mm-hmm. How does the enneagram? How do you do it mm-hmm. as a five? Mm-hmm. Um, a way that I I c- catch a glimpse of now and then has actually been a result of reflecting on a. A book in the Bible, we did a, a video on it, the book of Ecclesiastes. And um, so many 
amazing complexities mm-hmm. and nuances what's going on in that book. But um, one whole uh, way of life that the teacher is advocating in that book is a release of control. And mm-hmm. because so much of, I can see now my own uh, drives are fear mm. that motivates me to control knowledge mm-hmm. to help me feel like the world's a meaningful place and I have ma- some kind of control and mastery of it yeah. is to, what what if even, if, even if the universe does have meaning, purpose, and a story that has Jesus at its center, right? Mm-hmm. Even if that's the case. <laughs> Um, that's not something over which I have control, <laughs> even if that's true. Uh, I get to participate in it, and m- my own existence is enriched and brought into a whole community, the universe, <laughs> the community of the universe that is uh, brought into the love and glory of God. And so learning to live in a way that's just open, just open, um, mm. and open to receive what each day brings to, and if that's emotions and difficult things, not to suppress it or try and leverage up on it by analyzing it, you know. Uh, so for me, it's about learning to release control and a million different ways in my life. And like I said, I think the core discovery I named earlier, self-discovery, was about the fear of motivating my drive to master knowledge. And so for me, that's the number one task or a challenge for me is learning to live in a way that I receive every part of what each day brings. And I'm not trying to make it make sense to me, but just experiencing it. And, uh, and I can't, you know, I don't know. I'm not very good at it, but I can see that that's the place I I want to aspire to. And one of the things that the Enneagram I think does really Mm -hmm. well that I find super helpful is that it describes what a personality type um, looks like in health and mm-hmm. and then also looks like in unhealth um, and and what I what I love about that is it it ge- it can give you a vision of what your self redeemed mm. um, can be mm. unique to who you are and for me like a, a really healthy five from what I understand is like an iconoclast, someone who's not afraid to stand up and say, hey, I, I see things differently um, and uh, and I'll kind of courageously um, point the way. Um, and mm-hmm. and then in unhealth, you kind of, you you just get really flustered and frustrated and bitter and become a, a Scrooge and a hermit. <laughs> um, and everywhere in between, and uh, having that vision for what your distinct bent towards the way you live in the world can be redeemed mm. is, I think, really, really useful. And it's more than information. It's shaping your imagination. Mm. And um, out of that then comes, mm. flows everything. Mm. 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 That is so rich. Um, tell guys, tell everybody where they can... Uh, find out about you you guys the bible project and, and any new thing you're doing that they should be aware of hmm. yeah bibleproject.com uh that's where everything goes <laughs> yep and yeah. that's that that's yeah that's that <laughs> you, check if, it out if you go there you'll 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 learn about everything we're doing <laughs> wow well john and tim thank you so much for yeah, for thank being you, on typology we're i'm just so excited about the work that you're doing and i'm i'm just you know I love fives, man. <laughs> Thanks, fives Ian. Are, fives yeah. are fun. So um, uh, I just encourage everybody to go over and check out the Bible Project at BibleProject.com. And John, Tim, thank you. <laughs> yeah, Thanks, cheers. Ian. Thank you, Ian. And my dear friends, remember the words of the great Oscar Wilde. Be yourself. Everybody else is already taken. We'll see you. Hey, we hope you enjoyed the show with the Enneagram 5 duo of Tim Mackey and John Collins from The Bible Project. Stay connected with us on Twitter and Instagram at Typology Podcast and with Ian on Twitter at Ian Cron and on Instagram at Ian Morgan Cron. And remember the Patreon campaign, www.patreon.com forward slash typology hey we hope you all have a fantastic week and we'll see you next thursday right here same time same place on typology podcast 
Grace and peace.